and you're just like, quickly delete for everyone, delete, delete for all. <laughs> Like any true follower of science, I don't believe in any kind of psychic abilities. Me neither, Dave. It's obviously nonsense. And the people who you think are good at it are just better at conning you. Uh, format of the show, Dave wrote it, I read it. That's how we do things. Let's go. Among many things, this was an opinion shared by my legendary friend who I referred to in another video as The Other Dave. As we sat down in the pub one night, we got chatting to a charlatan, I mean a psychic, who had recently set up a business in some nearby offices. I don't think this should be allowed. I just don't think this should be allowed as a business. <laughs> it's like, what do you do? I'm a psychic. Not anymore, you don't. You gotta go find a real job and stop hustling people. All right, look, Lois, this psychic nonsense has gone too far, so I'm gonna prove to you that there is no such thing as someone who is psychic. It'd be like if you, if you like, w yeah, what's your business do? Hustler. Like, I just con people out. Hustler doesn't really mean that anymore, does it? What does hustler even mean? Like, I knew, hu like, hustler used to be a term for like someone who they do that thing with like the cups and they're like, where's the cup? Where's the cup? Find the cup. And then they trick you and they take your money away. I once saw someone doing that con and I didn't fall for it because I was like, I don't know. It just seems pretty bloody obvious. I was in Budapest and I was climbing up that, that there's like, like this hill and you go up and there's some like statue on top or whatever. And I'm going up there. And there's this dude and he's got these three cups and he's like, hey, follow the thing, follow the thing. And then there's some dude there and he's like handing over big money. And he's like, yeah, yeah, 50 euros, 100 euros says that I can find it. I'll get it this time, 100 euros. And then the dude's like, okay, find it. And as the mark, I'm watching this, right? And it seems incredibly easy. Like, it just looks like this guy with the money just seems to be super befuddled and just like this dumb old man who can't trace where the thing is because it's like poking out the bottom, you can hear it, whatever. And it's like, this looks really easy. How dumb is this guy? And then I'm like, oh, I see, I see. And then I left. But I'm sure they were successfully conning some people. Scam, 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 it's a scam. After this individual had droned on for about 20 minutes, telling us all about this uncanny ability to predict the future, other Dave turned to him and said that not only did he not believe he had any future predicting capabilities, but that he could almost certainly prove it beyond reasonable doubt. As I listened, other Dave made an appointment with the alleged psychic, chuckled smugly, and proceeded to carry on drinking for the rest of the evening. The next time I happened to run into other Dave in the pub, he had something very entertaining to show me a video. Not only was it very entertaining, it did indeed prove beyond reasonable doubt that he was correct and the aforementioned gentleman could not predict the future. The 30 second clip, the 30 second clip, the 30 second clip, the 30 second video, the 30 second video clip that he had taken on his mobile phone showed him entering the office building, knocking on the door belonging to the alleged psychic and receiving the following response. Who is it? After that, you just hear other Dave shout back, I told you you couldn't predict the future other dave committed to that joke like it's, it's a reasonable joke but the fact he committed so hard i like great job the video kept us all amused for many months after that although the story has absolutely nothing to do with the content of today's video we're three and a half minutes in it does bring me in a roundabout way to the point that i was trying to make after the last video on things that have recently been declassified wait is this a video about declassified files why the f we're talking about psychics, Dave! Well, it racked up a quarter of a million views in 10 days. Nice. I did not need any future predicting abilities to know that I would very soon be writing another one. Yes, as I always say, if a video does well, I'm creatively bankrupt and I'm going to do the same video again, just in a slightly different way. And you're all here for it. And I love you for that. I mean, I don't love you personally. I was just recording a casual criminalist where the guy says to his victims that he loves them and then he strangles them to death. So right now in my mind, me saying that is like kind of f***ed up, even though it's not f***ed up, it's just a joke. But casual criminalist is heavy sometimes, and it stays in my mind for a few days, and I don't like that. Anyway, <laughs> let's carry on. Just before we continue, a quick shout out to our amazing sponsor today, Squarespace. Whether you're a buzzing entrepreneur or a seasoned pro, Squarespace is your all-in-one platform for standing out and succeeding online. Design, sell, engage, it's all right there at your fingertips with Squarespace. Plus, you can create online courses. You might think, I know how to do this. I've got a giant brain relating to XYZ topic. Well, you go onto Squarespace, you build yourself a website, you upload a video, you set up a paywall. Boom, you're good to go. Course made, money earned. 
easy as pie. Plus, there are other features that make Squarespace your absolute go-to platform. They've got Fluid Engine, which is a drag and drop next generation style editor, which allows you to just have complete creative freedom to make what you want. You take one of their templates, you customize it, and it's just as easy as that to get a beautiful looking website. Ready to unleash your creativity? Go to squarespace.com slash blaze for a free trial. And when you're ready to launch, go to squarespace.com slash blaze to save 10% off your first purchase of a website or a domain with the promo code blaze. And now back to today's video. United States Army Moon Base. You could quite reasonably argue that the United States Armed Forces have a bit of a history when it comes to going places where they don't really have any business. However, if Lieutenant General Arthur G. Trudeau had gotten his way, United States military would have been the first to set up a base on a different celestial body, which would have been f***ing cool. Like, I'm a huge fan of that For All Mankind TV show, where this happens. And that would have been awesome. According to a report that he commissioned in 1969 that's recently declassified, quote, there is a requirement for a manned military outpost on the moon. The lunar outpost is required to develop and protect potential United States interests on the moon, to develop techniques in moon-based surveillance of the Earth and space, in communications relay, and in operations on the surface of the moon, to serve as a base for exploration of the moon, for further exploration into space, and for military operations on the moon if required. This guy's kind of bang on. Less about the military stuff. He's just 50 years too early. Although the quality of this document may well lead you to believe that it was in fact compiled by an 11-year-old child, it really did lead to the creation of Project Horizon, an exceptionally ambitious proposal aiming to have military personnel on the moon by 1966. According to the proposals, an underground base would be constructed in a pre-existing cave. This base would house between 10 and 20 personnel and would have room for sleeping quarters, a dining area, a research laboratory, and some sort of recreation room. As to how the base would be powered, the army planned to set up two nuclear reactors, one to power the base and one to power construction equipment. However, it was hoped that these reactors would only need to be a temporary solution and the entire installation would eventually be powered through the use of solar panels. This is so far ahead of its time, I f***ing love it. So. Why is it not there? Well, there are a number of reasons. Firstly, the logistics of transporting all of the necessary equipment to the moon quickly became a lot more complicated than the initial plans had believed. Secondly, the entire project would have been so expensive that it would have necessitated a huge rise in defense spending, which in turn would have caused a sharp rise in taxes. America's definitely not allergic to defense spending, isn't it? It's like it's like a trillion dollars or something mental. That's probably not true. But then it wasn't like two trillion dollars spent in Afghanistan or something? Which... Now, in retrospect, Afghanistan's still super f***ed up. And America, you could have had like a moon base or something sick like that. Thirdly, and perhaps most importantly, the entire project became a legal impossibility after the Soviet Union, United States, and United Kingdom signed a treaty in 1967 which prevented the moon from being used for anything other than peaceful research purposes. Which is probably a good thing, to be honest. I imagine that if oil had been located beneath the surface of the moon, the American military would have tried a little harder to achieve their ultimate goal. The Gay Bomb Imagine, if you will, a typical movie-styled battlefield scenario. Two opposing armies stand ready to engage in what promises to be an exceptionally bloody and horrific battle. All diplomatic avenues have been exhausted, and as far as anybody can tell, there's absolutely no way to prevent this battle from taking place. But wait, what's that? As you watch in silence, an aircraft swoops low over the battlefield and drops a single shell among a group of combatants. The shell bursts open and a fine pink mist spreads slowly across the ground. Of course it's pink. But what is it? Is it some sort of new diabolical nerve agent? Is it mustard gas? Some yes yet untested fast acting poison? Only time will tell. As the mist spreads, anybody who comes into contact with it seems to lose interest in the battle and instead becomes very interested in the soldiers standing next to them. After a few short minutes, the entire army is naked and engaged in a free-for-all gay orgy. <laughs> I mean, really? I, I know Dave's exaggerating, but what? <laughs> I've heard of this, but it's like, no, surely they didn't think it would actually work like this. While this entire scenario might sound like a storyline for some particularly unimaginative porn, I don't know, it sounds pretty f imaginative to be honest. A gay bomb? Documents released after a Freedom of Information request show that the US Air Force was actually working on something similar. A Guardian article published in 2007 states, the documents released to the Sunshine Project under a Freedom of Information request titled Harassing, Annoying, and Bad Guy Identifying Chemicals includes several proposals for the military use of chemicals that could be sprayed onto enemy positions. One distasteful but non-lethal example would be strong aphrodisiacs, especially if the chemical also caused homosexual behavior. That's a little gay. Hold on. So, 
I imagine the question that you're all secretly asking is, well, did it work? No, because we'd definitely have heard about this. If, like, the US was in Afghanistan and all the Taliban were, like, going around f***ing each other, we'd definitely know about that. Like, that would be in the news. <laughs> Obviously, no. Believe it or not, sexual preference doesn't work that way. The same Guardian article, which I shall repeat, was written in 2007, so it may not be completely up to date when it comes to correct terminology, went on to say, Aaron Belkin, director of the University of California's Michael Palm Center, which studies the issue of gays in the military. I don't think you can say gays anymore. You say homosexuals. Or what? I don't even know what the correct term is anymore, but gays in the military just sounds wrong. The idea that you could submit someone to some aerosol spray and change their sexual behavior is ludicrous. However, I'm quite surprised that nobody has made a movie about this. Maybe they have, Dave. You're probably just on the wrong website. America accidentally bombed Mexico. I bet that movie exists. I'm sorry, I'm not going to go look for the gay porn of this, but I bet it exists. As you can probably appreciate, when new weapons are developed, it's usually better to carry out testing before actually using them in combat. When it comes to testing, say, a missile, you would think that the military would be exceptionally careful about making sure that it landed in the right place. Unfortunately, in 1970, a missile fired from the Green River Launch Complex in Utah was supposed to land at the White Sands Missile Range in New Mexico, and it went a little bit off and landed in Mexico. The following is the text that ChatGPT extracted from a photograph of the secret memo from Henry Kissinger to President Nixon telling him about the accident. Uh, because Dave is blind, not just because he loves ChatGPT. Dave sometimes shits on ChatGPT, not as much as Kevin. And it hurts my feelings. And it probably hurts ChatGPT's feelings, because it definitely has feelings. Because it's real, and it's my friend. I'm sorry, Dave. Secret. July 11, 1970. Memorandum for the President from Henry A. Kissinger. Subject, missile test accident. Henry Kissinger used to be my favorite example of, surprise, they're still alive, except now he's dead. So I can't do that anymore. I, I used to be Chuck Yeager as well, but now he's dead. Sad, isn't it? I mean, is it? Chuck Yeager, yeah, he was a legend, but people didn't really seem to mind that Henry Kissinger died. I don't really know much about Henry Kissinger. He was uh, a little bit before my time. I feel like he was before my parents' time and somehow he's still alive. At 5 a.m. EDT today, an Athena rocket test fired from Green River, Utah, overshot its target at White Sands, New Mexico, and impacted 180 to 200 miles south of the Mexican border. Since the missile entered an abnormal re-entry into the atmosphere, it is believed that less than 100 pounds of debris actually impacted onto the ground. The precise location of impact has not yet been determined, but the general area is known to be sparsely populated. The State Department has notified Mexican governments, which has indicated its willingness to grant clearances and assist in any search efforts. The quote Ends. Fortunately, as we can see from that, the Mexican government was exceptionally cool about one of America's more explosive toys going off target. The fact that they were so neighborly about the whole thing is even more surprising when you discover that on board the missile there were two small vials of Cobalt 57. That's mega radioactive. If you don't know what this is, I certainly didn't. Here's a helpful description that I found online. An isotope used to enhance radioactive fallout with the intention of contaminating large areas of land, commonly referred to as a salted bomb. Yeah, salted bombs, really bad news. Once the actual landing site had been located, the cleanup and decontamination process were both long and costly. Among other things, it necessitated the building of a new road through the Mapimi Desert so the thousands of tons of contaminated soil could be removed. Two small vials. Thousands of tons of contaminated soil. Be wild, Cobalt. Although you might be inclined to write this off as a completely unforeseeable accident, further declassified documents from the time show that such an event had not only been foreseen, but that certain individuals have suggested the termination of any such testing programs until guidance systems have been improved. <laughs> at least guidance enough to not go to another f***ing country. Unfortunately, as America was, at that time, involved in quite a serious arms race with the Soviet Union, these recommendations were completely ignored. <laughs> Russian dog. Capitalist pig. Project 1794. If any Americans who are watching have a crazy elderly relative who claims that during the 1950s they actually saw a flying saucer, then it is just possible that they may not, in fact, be as crazy as you think. During the 1950s, the United States Air Force began working on a top-secret aircraft known as Project 1794. If this project had ever got on off the ground, so to speak, ah, then it would have been an absolutely incredible piece of kit. According to documents declassified in 2012, this saucer-shaped craft would have been capable of vertical takeoff and landing, an average speed of 2,600 miles per hour, 4,200 kilometers an hour, that's ridiculous, a flight ceiling of 100,000 feet, that's three times the size of a commercial jet, and a maximum range of 1,000 nautical miles. Holy sh**, this is an incredible thing. 
In the 50s? As a potential future pilot, I shall leave it up to Simon to explain the difference between normal people miles and nautical miles. Nautical miles are just slightly longer. So, what happens? Why are we all not spinning around in the world in futuristic discs? Well, apparently, the project initially started off fairly well. The project development stage was completed and a few prototypes were created. Not only that, early analysis showed the craft to be even better than expected. According to one section of the declassified document, the present design will provide much superior performance than that estimated at the start of contracting negotiations. Sadly, all of this analysis had taken place on the ground. When they actually tried to fly the thing, the results were not quite as positive. Initially, the maiden flight went perfectly. That is, until the saucer achieved the dizzying height of three feet. It's hardly the 100,000 feet they wanted, is it? At this point, the cushion of air quickly dissipated and the saucer began to shake uncontrollably. Try as they might, the engineers were never able to satisfactorily rectify the problem. And so, the project was discontinued. According to an aerospace engineer who was kind enough to take the time out of his busy day to discuss the project with me, if the designers had access to modern flight control, computer systems, the flying saucer may well have been at least a partially viable mode of transportation. However, it is highly unlikely that it would have been able to serve its initial purpose, intercepting and destroying Soviet bombers. Still, the vertical takeoff technology was not entirely without merit, and according to that self-same engineer, a fairly similar turbofan system would later be used in the Harrier jump jet. Soviet jokes for the DDCI We've all been there. I know I certainly have. You accidentally hit the wrong button and you've suddenly sent an exceptionally inappropriate joke or comment to the wrong person. Yes, yes. And you're just like, quickly, delete for everyone! Delete! Delete for all! <laughs> The most awkward situation I found myself in after making such a mistake involved two separate WhatsApp conversations with two people of the same name. Colin's dad, an exceptionally amusing elderly relative from my pub, had just passed away, and quite naturally, I wished to send my most sincere condolences to him and his family. Unfortunately, another friend of mine called Colin was involved in an ongoing joke with myself and the deceased regular about a £20 unpaid bet. The message that I accidentally sent to the grieving son read, Did you hear about Frank? Definitely not going to get that £20 bag now. That sneak. Bust. <laughs> I hope that if I, I, I like to think that if I was the son in that situation, I'd take it in the good humor that it was intended, and I'd just be like, "Oh, it's nice that he had friends who he liked joking around with." Because even the text doesn't read too serious. Dave, chill, chill on this one. Forgive yourself. This is totally fine. It's obviously a joke. If I had been fortunate enough to be the deputy director of Central Intelligence. <laughs> Okay, that I could have immediately classified the message, and that would have been the end of it. This is what happens with a list of jokes made about Soviet leaders that were sent internally during the Cold War. No way. Obviously, as they were written by some bureaucrat somewhere, all of these jokes lack something. More specifically, they lack an element of humor. Nevertheless, I shall inflict upon you the shortest. Sentence from a schoolboy's weekly composition class essay, My cat just had seven kittens. They are all communists. Sentence from the same boy's composition, the following week, my cat's seven kittens are all capitalists. <laughs> I, I got, it's, it's not bad. It's not a bad joke. The teacher reminds the boy that the previous week that the kittens had been communists, but now they've opened their eyes, replies the child. Oh, okay, so there is a punchline. I just thought it was funny that, you know, like ideologically, they didn't last as communists very long, which at the time was kind of funny. But now they open their eyes. Okay, I get it. I get it. It's it's not bad. It's not bad. It was bad. It was not bad before even the punchline. And I just want to say to the Russians, I know how it is when you start getting aggressive because your <laughs> doesn't work the way it used to. Duh. See what I mean? Hardly the work of Dylan Moran, Billy Connolly, or Eddie Izzard. Someone somewhere, somebody somewhere was obviously genuinely concerned that should these zingers get out, it might cause a diplomatic incident, so they were classified and locked away. It would not be until the 27 it would not be until 2017 that the United States government saw fit to release this trove of comedy gold to the public. As I mentioned in my previous script on declassified files, I usually can't wait to peruse things that our various governments decided that we don't need to know. Unfortunately, a lot of these documents are available only as image files. This means I have to download the file, convert it into text using some sort of OCR program, paste that text into ChatGPT to correct any errors, and then finally I can sit down and actually read them. Whilst this is usually worth the effort, the jokes that someone believed might actually have started World War III certainly were not. And that, ladies and gentlemen, brings us to the end of this second episode. If it turns out to be as popular as the, thir as the last one, then I, can probably have an then I probably have enough material to make a third. Excellent. If it gets a lot of views, we will absolutely do that. And thanks for being here. I'll see you next time. Then I'm like, oh, I see. I see. And then I left. But I'm sure they were successfully con conning some people. Scam, 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 scam. It's a scam.